Hello everyone and welcome to Talking the Talkies. My name is Peter Waters and we have done it. We've reached the end of the year of 2021. Uh, so you know what that means. Lots of end of the year movie lists. But before we get to my top 10 of 2021, I wanted to continue my tradition of doing my best and worst movie superlatives. In the past I've always done this as a tradition on my uh, blogger page. But uh, now I'm going to do it through the power of YouTube. So I have 15 categories this year, which is the most I've ever done. And pretty much it's going to be honoring specific categories in film. So it's pretty much like the Peter Waters version of the Oscars. So I have for each category four honorable mentions, one runner up, and then one special film that was crowned the winner of each category. So without wasting any of your time, here we go with the top superlatives of 2021. Alrighty, so first up we have Best Actor, and here are my honorable mentions. First up, kind of cheating, but I have a tie here for Judas and the Black Messiah, both Daniel Kaluuya and Lakeith Stanfield. I had them as a tie because their characters in the movie are kind of in a perfect symbiotic relationship, just like Eddie Brock and Venom. Daniel Kaluuya plays the leader of the Black Panther Party, and then you have Lakeith Stanfield, who was hired as a petty criminal. Uh, in order for him to get his rap sheet cleared, he has to infiltrate the Black Panther Party, and then he slowly starts to, uh, you know, become enticed by their messages. Uh, so they were both so great together, and you can't have one without the other, so I had it as a tie. Sorry if that's cheating. Next up is George McKay in the movie Wolf. He is a young man who genuinely believes he is a wolf, and he's in an institution for other like-minded uh, youths who believe that they are animals. It's a very intense, very physical performance, and it was captivating the entire time, so that's honorable mention. Also, Simon Rex in the movie Red Rocket. In this movie, he plays a complete scumbag. He's an ex-porn star uh, coming home from L.A. to Texas, where um, he's down on his luck, and pretty much he does some of the sketchiest things imaginable in order to make his way back into the top of the adult video world. Um, it's a really great movie from Sean Baker and Simon Rex, uh, who I'd never seen before, that I know of anyway, uh, really bears it all in this uh, very emotionally uh, vulnerable role as well as a very physically revealing role at times. And then my last honorable mention is John David Washington from Malcolm and Marie. Uh, John David Washington is the son of Denzel Washington, and he is great in this movie. He plays this uh, black filmmaker who forgets to thank his wife at an award ceremony, and pretty much his um, marital problems spiral out from there, and the whole movie is just one, pretty much one long argument, and he is great in the film, so that one kind of got unfairly maligned, I think. Uh, but all of these performances are some of my favorites, but they aren't my top two favorites. So here is my uh, runner-up here, and my runner-up is Steven Yun from Minari. He plays the father of this Korean-American household, and he has this American dream to start this farm, uh, but he runs into all sorts of problems. And pretty much it's a movie about someone who is in the middle of cultural identity uh, because he's trying to carve out this new life in America, uh, but he doesn't fit in with anyone. Uh, and then also, um, you know, he's leaving his homeland behind and he is just so great in this movie. It's just a wonderful family drama with humor and heart. And pretty much all the actors in this movie are fantastic. And Steven Yeun uh, pretty much shows that he's not just that random character on The Walking Dead. He has a lot to offer, and I can't wait to see what he does next. And then finally, the best actor winner is, in fact, Anthony Hopkins for The Father. A lot of people were disappointed when he won the Oscar for this role because he sort of stole it from Chadwick Boseman, who was dead and everyone wanted to honor him. But anyone who saw The Father will tell you that this is a well-deserved award. He basically plays um, an older man who is suffering from Alzheimer's and he really truly puts you in his headspace. And it's a very powerful uh, film. It's maybe hard to watch at times, but his performance is never less than riveting. So I highly recommend The Father. Great, great movie. All right, and our next category is Best Actress. And uh, also keep in mind, I smush together both lead and supporting actor and actress together. So in case that was 
a question you had, I don't uh, separate the two. So supporting and leads all together. All right, first up, the second half of uh, Malcolm and Marie, Marie herself. Zendaya is also uh, on my honorable mention. I really like that movie, and she is great in it. She's, again, not just MJ, the new MJ from Spider-Man movies. She is a fantastic actress, and I highly recommend you also watch the show Euphoria, where she's great in it. Uh, Malcolm and Marie, also directed by uh, the showrunner for Euphoria, and he also, uh, in this film, just gets these great performances out of his actors. So, uh, yeah, she is great in that movie. Also, Jessica Chastain in the eyes of Tammy Faye. She plays Tammy Faye, sort of a notorious televangelist, and this sort of uh, puts the narrative back into her favor, sort of, uh, for this controversial figure in sort of um, religion, I guess you would say. Um, and Jessica Chastain delivers one of her best performances ever, which is saying a lot because she's one of my favorite actresses. So... Uh, definitely check that one out. Uh, also, Rebecca Hall in The Night House. This was one of those rare horror movies that um, was really character-focused, not just focused on scares. It gets really into the psychology of its main character, and Rebecca Hall does a fantastic job. She is probably one of those underrated actresses that um, I hope someday she gets some nominations. She really deserved one for Christine a couple of years ago, and she's probably going to get snubbed all over the place again for The Night House, but very deserving uh, film. Uh, also, Frances McDormand for Nomadland. Uh, it's easy to take for granted, uh, Frances McDormand, but if you think about it, what she did in this movie is pretty incredible. She seamlessly uh, goes into these sort of nomad communities who are have no home, and they're just traveling around the country in buses and vans and things, and she really felt like one of these people. And um, it's a very quiet, subtle performance, but uh, it was enough to earn her Best Actress, her third... Um, Best Actress uh, win at the Oscars for this role. So um, it is a fantastic performance, even if it's not as showy as some of these other ones. All right, so my runner-up for Best Actress is Yu Jung Yoon for Minari. Uh, just like uh, like I said, Steven Yun was my uh, Best Actor runner-up. Yu Jung Yoon is the grandmother in Minari, and she is so wonderful. She has so much heart, so much... Um, sadness as well. Uh, she's pretty much one of the best characters um, in the film. Um, she's just a joy to watch. She also won the uh, she also won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. So um, just see this movie. It's so good. No words I use to describe it will really uh, capture um, how great this film is. So go check it out. Minari. Yo Jung Yoon. Totally deserving of that Oscar. But who is the Best Actress of the Year? This is an actress that should have won Best Actress at last year's Oscars, I would say. And it is Vanessa Kirby for Pieces of a Woman. So this movie, um, just sort of describing the premise of it is a little bit of a spoiler. But, uh, so without really going into details, Vanessa Kirby, um, there's, the movie opens up on one long, unbroken take that probably lasts about 15 minutes, and it's probably some of the best acting I've ever seen in my life. Uh, Vanessa Kirby was not on my radar before this movie, and now I am going to follow her career. Uh, she is so good. Um, basically, that first scene is a home birth gone wrong, and that's all I'll say. Uh, I won't say exactly what goes wrong or what happens, but it's a very intense scene, and um, she is fantastic in the film, and the rest of the movie is the aftermath of that first event. Um, and she's great, and she plays opposite Ellen Burstyn in the film. Uh, it's a wonderful performance, wonderful movie, super underrated. Um, I feel like it was one of those movies that kind of got buried, so it's on Netflix now. Check it out for one of the best performances of the year. All right. My next category is Best Movie Trailer, and here are some honorable mentions. Um, this one might be a little bit tough to talk about because uh, you won't be able to see the trailers in this video, but I will provide links for you in the description below. Uh, first up is Quiet Place Part 2. I love the way this trailer opens up where uh, 
you know, no music, no narration, nothing like that. It just says what day it is, day one, and then we see the alien invasion from inside of this car in one long unbroken take, and it really puts you in the world of the film. Uh, so Quiet Place Part 2, really great. Uh, Candyman, the way they intercut uh, the sort of anim stop motion animated bits as well as the movie, and you have some really deep, scary um, narration from the villain himself, Candyman, uh, was really great. Uh, the new James Bond movie, No Time to Die, very uh, thrilling action sort of trailer that really does a great job showcasing some of the big action set pieces and stunts in the film. And then also In the Heights, which, again, uh, it's this musical, and it does a great job highlighting some of those musical numbers and the vibes of it. And, um, yeah, just all great trailers that gets you pumped for the movies. Uh, my runner-up for Best Movie Trailer is The Green Knight. This is a movie from A24 that's sort of this fantasy epic, but uh, shot on an indie scale, but it does not look like an indie movie. Um, it has so many beautiful visuals, uh, so many captivating moments that it really feels tailor-made to make for a great trailer. And it just feels epic and sweeping and you would never know. It's not on the budget of like a Lord of the Rings or anything like that. So uh, definitely check out the trailer for The Green Knight. Uh, in many ways, I thought, found it more entertaining than the film itself. But the best movie trailer of the year is a movie I've mentioned already. It is Judas and the Black Messiah. This is, again, the movie um, about the Black Panther Party. Um, so it's a period piece. And what I love about this trailer is the way it's edited together. And it's sort of, um, you hear one of the main speeches from the film, from Fred Hampton, overlaid over all of the events of the movie. So uh, again, Daniel Kaluuya does a great job in this film. And it's sort of his powerhouse speech that drives the rhythm of this trailer. And that's what makes it so powerful. Um, so you can kind of see why someone would be drawn to a presence like this. Uh, so yeah, Judas and the Black Messiah. Um, great movie trailer and great movie, great performances, great everything. Yay. All right, next category is best music score. Even though some of my go-to genres are hard rock and heavy metal, uh, very frequently I will find myself listening to movie scores um, in isolation as well. So some of my favorite ones that I will be probably listening to for a while. Uh, first up is Nomadland uh, by Ludovico Ainaudi, I believe you pronounce it. He is this really great pianist. And uh, even though uh, technically this is a little bit of a cheat because a lot of the pieces from Nomadland were already written before the movie, um, pretty much it functions as a score for the film. And it is fantastic. Also, Pieces of a Woman from Howard Shore is a really great one. Very emotionally involving and has that kind of melancholy sadness underneath it. Uh, Dune, Hans Zimmer. This is one that I would watch out for for this year's Oscars. Uh, very bombastic uh, score as per usual, but also uh, it sort of functions as uh, sound effects as well. He used a lot of like uh, different kinds of objects and things uh, to for the score to bring that world to life. So that one was also impressive. And also Minari um, as well had a really interesting subtle score that uh, perfectly captures that sort of uh, nostalgic, melancholic um, family vibe. It's hard to put into words, but you hear a couple notes of it and you just sort of feel transported into the 1950s. All right, so my runner-up for best music score is, again, another runner-up category for The Dark Knight. Uh, so Daniel Hart, he has very frequently collaborated with the director of The Green Knight, David Lowry. Um, he also did a ghost story. And um, The Green Knight score, really, if we're talking about music that transports you, if you listen to The Green Knight, you really feel like you are in the fantasy world of this film. They have like chanting and old school instruments, and it really does feel like you are in the Middle Ages, or at least our fantasized version of what the Middle Ages would sound like. It is a fantastic score, and it's very unique, uh, unlike any other score that I have heard this year. So that's why I gave it the runner-up award. But what won this category for best music score? It is Raya and the Last Dragon. This is a, a Disney animated film that was released 
earlier this year, it kind of got swept under the rug unjustly because it's a fantastic fantasy film and James Newton Howard yet again does a fantastic score. He scored uh, The Dark Knight alongside Hans Zimmer and in this one he also does a great job bringing this world to life. Um, very varied score. He has like epic action beats and then he has kind of silly, almost like... Um, has this exotic Crash Bandicoot flavor to it, if you know those games. Um, it's just one of the most listenable scores of the year. It's one of those scores that I return to and listen to uh, often, so that's why I rated it uh, the winner, because not only is it a great score, but it's also listenable. A lot of movie scores, they sort of function almost like background noise uh, to usher you along the film, but when you listen to them isolated, sort of like Dune, uh, they're not as interesting to listen to, but this one is great, and uh, I highly recommend it. So, Ryan and the Last Dragon gets the best score from me. All right, next category. We have Best Original Song. All right, so first up, we have uh, a tie for the movie Music. Now, the movie Music garnered a lot of controversy this year because of what it was about, but... It's undeniable that some of the music in the film was great because it was directed by Sia, who's one of the great pop stars of today. And I have a tie for the songs Together and One Plus One, which are both really great uh, pop songs, very joyous and fun to listen to. Also, I have the end credit song for Judas and the Black Messiah by the artist Her called Fight For You. That one won the Oscar for Best Original Song last year as well. Um, I also have a Bollywood film on here. I don't watch too many Bollywood films, to be completely honest. And there's a movie I saw very early in the year called Master, and there is one particular really, truly epic Bollywood dance sequence in the film called Vathi Coming. And if you look on YouTube, this has like millions and millions of views. So uh, even though probably Americans have no idea what this is, clearly it has its audience. And it is this truly epic scene unnecessarily epic because it's literally about a professor who is late to school and I guess his students are trying to get him out of bed and get him to school and in that very simple scene there are like what looks like thousands of extras all dancing in synchronization to these heavy beat drums and it is just like this randomly epic scene and it's just filled with joy and great music and drums and it's a great song, so I'm going to include that one on the list. Also, uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda's Disney uh, movie Encanto uh, also features a lot of great uh, Colombian-inspired music, and probably my favorite song from that film is We Don't Talk About Bruno, uh, which is sort of about the estranged family member in the Madrigal family from that film. Uh, so these are all great songs, but what is my runner-up this year? It is Welcome to the Internet from Bo Burnham's comedy special Inside. Now, so I could have gone with so many different uh, options from Inside, but the one that keeps nagging at the back of my brain is Welcome to the Internet because it really does capture how trapped we are in our obsession with the web. It offers us everything, and we're kind of, you know hypnotized by the internet and in this song he almost takes on this persona of a snake oil salesman trying to entice you uh he's like the personification of the internet um it's a really clever song really catchy uh rhythm to it um i love this song and it's one of the best from a really great sort of comedy musical special that he did but what is my number one song of the year it is the latest James Bond intro song from Billie Eilish, No Time to Die, from the movie No Time to Die. Uh, this is just a fantastic song. Billie Eilish's sort of whispery, um, hypnotic vocals uh, pretty much works perfectly for a James Bond uh, song. So even though she's not British, it works perfectly. And uh, this is just truly an epic song. I don't know what else to say about it. It's just a fantastic James Bond theme. I would rank it among some of the best. So I would highly expect this one to win uh, this category at the Oscars this year. All right, next category is Best Poster. 
Okay, so poster designs are kind of a dying art nowadays. So uh, when I see a good poster, it usually stands out really well. So here are my honorable mentions. First up, it's George Romero's movie, The Amusement Park. Now, George Romero died a few years back, so you might be surprised to see this movie, but I'm counting it as a 2021 release because even though it was shot in the 70s, it was just recently discovered and put out on the streaming app Shudder. And to promote that movie on Shudder, uh, we have this wonderful poster that sort of really uh, shows um, what the movie is about. It's pretty much about this old man who uh, goes to this amusement park, and it's sort of the amusement park of his nightmares, and it's sort of a movie about the fears of growing old. So you have, uh, you know, this demented carousel inside of this guy's head. It's a very striking image, so I thought that was kind of a cool poster. Also, we have the IMAX poster for Nomadland. It looks really cool. It has this sort of uh, painted map design of all the different stops Fern went on her journey. Uh, very cool looking poster. We also have the very striking first image that a lot of us saw for the movie Cruella, and Emma Stone just has this very cool look. It almost looks like a fashion magazine a photo shoot or something like that. Uh, very cool look in the stark black and white, I must say. It is a very cool poster. And then also the illustrated poster for Licorice Pizza is a really great one. It kind of evokes like uh, movies from the 70s, like... Um, American Graffiti and things like that, uh, and that's sort of what this movie is going for, those so, sort of old hangout movies from the 1970s era. Um, so yeah, Licorice Pizza, very cool poster. But what is my runner-up? It is a movie that I've never actually seen. So this is on my to-watch list. This is a Nicolas Cage movie. Um, I'm guessing it's some sort of an action film uh, called Prisoners of the Ghost Land, and it also stars Bill Bosley, who's in a lot of Rob Zombie movies. And um, yeah, I'm excited to see it. This poster uh, is very cool. It's like samurais and lots of uh, striking colors. Uh, it has my attention. Uh, so even though I haven't seen the movie, definitely intrigued by this poster. But my number one poster of the year, it's actually from a director who has won this award from me in the past uh, for the movie Jackie. And the winner is the movie Spencer from Pablo Lorraine. So uh, just like with Jackie, how it kind of was a very striking image uh, that captured Jackie O, this is an Another very striking image that captures Princess Diana. Uh, Spencer is sort of like this, it's almost made like a horror movie where uh, she feels trapped in the royal family and this poster kind of perfectly captures those feelings. You have this completely dark void in the background and you have Princess Diana sort of face down, uh, sort of cowering, engulfed by this, you know, very uh, fancy dress. Uh, so it's almost like she's drowning in this royal life, and there's nothing, uh, there's no escape from it. It's a very striking uh, poster. It's the sort of image that you almost would expect to see in an art gallery. If you didn't have all the, like, titles and the, you know, coming soon stuff down below, it literally would look like a frameable uh, intriguing piece of art that would be framed in a museum. So for that reason, Spencer gets my award for best poster. All right, next category is best action scene. We have Zack Snyder re-released uh, Justice League on HBO Max in his epic like four-part uh, extended cut of the film uh, that re-edited it uh, because not a lot of people were fans of uh, the theatrical version. And one of the new action scenes from his version was uh, re one of the best that he's ever done. Um, we have uh, the character The Flash saves a girl and there's like slow motion hot dogs. It's a really uh, well done scene and it's kind of shocking that that was excluded from the original version. Also, another superhero movie, we have Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. There's an extremely awesome kung fu fight on a bus in that movie. We also, speaking of kung fu, have Mortal Kombat. Uh, we have the big showdown between Sub-Zero and Scorpion. And the scene from the trailer that is pretty epic is Sub-Zero. His power is that he freezes things. He pretty much uh, punches... Scorpion so hard blood sprays out of him and then he freezes that blood and stabs him with a blood sickle. 
Nothing is more epic than that. It has to get an honorable mention. And then finally, it's kind of a spoiler, but there is a giant uh, police station shootout in the movie Malignant towards the end of it that is particularly epic as well. All right, so my runner-up for best action scene is another Zack Snyder film called Army of the Dead. And Zack Snyder is particularly well known for doing amazing opening credits sequences, uh, like in Watchmen and even Batman vs. Superman. They all have really great opening credits sequences, usually in slow motion, and Army of the Dead is no exception. In this one, it's a zombie movie, and it shows the apocalyptic fall of Las Vegas as it succumbs to the zombie invasion. There's plenty of explosions, plenty of slow-mo, and it is so epic. It has more action in it than most action movies and it's just within the first like 10-15 minutes of the film this is a truly epic opening to a really solid zombie film so I'm giving it the honorable mention uh, runner up here anyway all right but my number one action scene of the year is from a little film called Nobody uh, so this movie takes Bob Odenkirk and gives him the John Wick treatment, and you would be surprised how effective it is. Uh, pretty much this scene of him beating down a bunch of bad guys in a bus uh, pretty much completely sold me on this movie. Um, when I first heard that uh, Bob Odenkirk, you know, Saul from Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad was going to be in an action film, I thought that was kind of a desperate move, but... Uh, the movie will make you believe that uh, this middle-aged guy can get revenge on a bunch of Russian guys. All right, next category is Best Cinematography. So this is pretty much uh, what the camera is doing. So camera movements and uh, framing and things like that. First up is Titane, which was recently snubbed both at the Golden Globes and it's not even on the short list for uh, Oscars for the foreign film. So uh, it was one that won at the Cannes Film Festival. And so it's kind of surprising not to see the or it's kind of surprising to see the love it's not getting uh, this award season. But uh, the critics uh, definitely enjoyed it, and the cinematography is amazing. Particularly, it opens up on this really long tracking shot through a car show, and it kind of feels like uh, the Goodfellas long shot, only uh, with a woman doing things to a car. Let's just say that. Um, also, Dan Lawson from Nightmare Alley. Uh, Guillermo del Toro always has really beautiful cinematography, and Nightmare Alley is no different. Um, very, pretty much his version of a film noir. Also, Blue Bayou. This is a movie that I wish was getting more Oscars attention, but it's getting nothing. No one seems to remember this movie or have seen it, but it is fantastic. And it does have my favorite opening shot of any film this year. It's just so beautiful. I couldn't find a picture of the opening shot, unfortunately, online. But, uh, it has this very uh, grainy, filmy look that uh, feels very lived in and real. So I love the uh, look of Blue Bayou. Also, uh, Last Night in Soho, Edgar Wright. Edgar Wright always has some really cool camera tricks and things like that. And Last Night in Soho, very great uh, cinematography as well. But what is my runner-up this year? It is West Side Story. So Steven Spielberg. He pretty much is one of the best filmmakers ever of all time. Um, I wasn't a huge fan of West Side Story as a film necessarily, but in terms of all the technical skill it took to create, it, you can't help but be impressed by it. And uh, the camera is constantly uh, moving and it's very vibrant and alive. And there's so many uh, breathtaking shots uh, in the dance numbers and things like that. So West Side Story gets my runner up for best cinematography. Uh, really does a great job capturing this epic feeling of a giant movie musical that you don't see too much anymore. But the award for best cinematography goes to The Green Knight again. Uh, so this is probably one of the best looking movies I have seen in a very long time, even though it was a little slow for my taste. Uh, there's no denying that uh, it truly transports you into this epic fantasy world uh, with a lot of really interesting uh, painterly... Um, compositions and it's very so many striking images and really cool looking frames that you could pretty much take almost any shot from this movie and frame it. It's really a beautiful uh, film. Uh, so The Green Knight gets my award for best cinematography. Uh, looks unlike any movie you'll see this year. All right my next category is Best costume. So uh, this is one uh, another uh, category that is super important. What a character wears can tell a whole lot about who they are. Um, 
and kind of an underrated category uh, every year, best costumes. So anyway, here are my top costumes, honorable mentions. Uh, we have Harley Quinn's uh, jacket from The Suicide Squad, uh, kind of a classic Harley Quinn look. Um, we have Raya's costume from Raya and the Last Dragon. Um, we have the Queen Zombie from Army of the Dead. Uh, and we have Anita's yellow dress from West Side Story. All very striking looks. Uh, but what is my runner-up this year for best costume? It is Mirabelle's dress from Encanto. I was just as impressed by this dress as I was uh, Merida's hair from Pixar's Brave. There was just something about it that I was hypnotized by. The colors, the way it moved. It felt like so realistic in how it physically moved. It did not feel like an animated film. It felt photorealistic. Uh, you could almost see every tiny little stitch in this dress. It was such an impressive feat of animation. It's so colorful, so beautiful, perfectly captures the spirit of this character and this world and this movie uh, that, I don't know, for some reason this dress just struck me as I watched the film. So I have to give it the runner up, but the best costume of the year. And, uh, what I think will probably end up winning this category at the Oscars is everything in Cruella. Uh, it was hard to pick just one screenshot from this movie because almost everything that Cruella wears in this film is epic and amazing um, because, you know, her role in the film is this, um, uh, is this character who is wanting to break into the fashion world. So everything that she wears has this very uh, deliberate style to it. It's very cool. Uh, and also she's kind of like this punk rock character in the Disney universe. So I really appreciated her sort of edginess to uh, her character as well. So best costumes, pretty much everything that Cruella wears in the film. All right, next category is best set design. So pretty much this is all of the locations that were built for a film. Uh, first up is a movie that's probably not going to be on anyone else's top 10 anything list, but Escape Room Tournament of Champions. Uh, the Escape Room films are really clever little horror films that have amazing set designs in them. Um, each room that they go into, pretty much more people uh, die as they go from room to room, and it's sort of like a uh, uh, saw for tweens, but uh, the escape rooms themselves are really kind of cool and clever how they're uh, created. Um, so yeah, I would give an honorable mention to Escape Room Tournament of Champions, uh, the sequel to the first Escape Room. Also, The Green Knight, again, just the way it's designed, the way it looks, everything about it uh, looks great, so that includes the set design. Uh, the really not quite great uh, science fiction film Reminiscence, uh, one thing that was great about it was its set design. Um, and then finally West Side Story, again, the look of it, the design of it, the production of it was fantastic. All right, but what is my runner up? It is Last Night in Soho. This is Edgar Wright's latest film. And he very much the same way that Quentin Tarantino brought the 1960s Hollywood to life Edgar Wright brings 1960s London to life, and he has so many great sets in this film, including this epic uh, nightclub that definitely feels like it's from the swinging 60s, and he has all these like mirrors because um, we have the characters who are sort of reflections of each other. He has like old school uh, movie billboards. It's just, it feels like you are transported. That's what we go to the movies for, to feel transported. So. Last Night in Soho, definitely a great uh, production design. But what is has the best production design of the year? It is Nightmare Alley, uh, Guillermo del Toro. He has such a great uh, vision for design. Um, if you ever see interviews with him, he sketches everything visually in his notebook. And the set design in Nightmare Alley is no exception. It looks beautiful and nightmarish and perfectly fits into the typical uh, weird fantastical worlds of Guillermo del Toro. So I have to give Nightmare Alley the win here. All right, next category is Best TV Series. Okay, there's... We're pretty much in a TV renaissance right now, so there's so many options to uh, pick from, but these were some of my personal favorites. Uh, the Underground Railroad is Barry Jenkins' uh, mini-series from Amazon Prime, which is sort of, um, it's not quite historical. It's sort of a fantastical take on The Underground Railroad. It's very hard to watch at times, but really uh, great characters and very dramatic um, well shot, beautiful movie. As always from Barry Jenkins, he never disappoints. One of the great filmmakers today. 
Um, also, the two-part HBO Max documentary on Tiger Woods. Tiger was a very fascinating look at this controversial sports figure. Uh, WandaVision from Disney Plus. It was the show that sort of started the uh, MCU on Disney Plus, the Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, spin-off shows, and it started off with a really great show uh, that sort of combined superhero movies and old sitcoms. Who would have known that would uh, fit together really well? Um, also, the detective show Mayor of Easttown on HBO Max is a wonderful showcase for Kate Winslet, as if we didn't already know uh, she was one of the great actresses today. All right, so runner-up for this category is Squid Game. As you might tell from my shirt, I'm a huge Squid Game fan, and this show swept America by storm this year. Um, who knew a South Korean uh, sort of take on Saw became one of the biggest surprise hits uh, of the year. And yeah, it's great. The acting is great. Uh, I love how it sort of takes these childhood games that you would probably remember from your childhood and completely perverts them in very twisted ways. Um, it's a show about greediness and it's a show about, uh, you know, humanity and the choices we make. It's such a fascinating uh, study in human behavior and it's this thrilling show, the stakes are high, it's just a wonderful show all around, um, and yeah, I think there's a reason why this has become one of the breakout hits of the year. It's a fantastic show, Squid Game, check it out if you haven't already, join the club, it's great. But my number one show of the year is something that's a little bit more depressing, but it's so, so good. It is 9-11, One Day in America. Uh, this was put out by National Geographic, and currently you can watch this on Hulu, the last time I checked, and this is a mini-series that pretty much has tons of interviews and archival footage from that horrible day in American history, and it is so emotional and well done, and in particular, it really highlights the sacrifice that these firefighters made on that day. I mean, I always knew in the back of my mind that the firefighters, of course, they sacrificed themselves and they tried to save the day. But when you're put in there, in this documentary, the weight of those decisions on that day, the, these guys who went in to what was their death in order to try to save as many people as possible, it is truly moving. And you get like firsthand testimonials from the people that were there and the footage that they got. It's unbelievable how much footage they have. It was riveting from beginning to end, and it's an important document. Uh, Squid Game is entertaining, but this movie, I think everyone needs to watch. It is a great, great series, and one that will be important for history, honestly. So that is my pick for our best TV series, is 9-11, One Day in America. All right, my next category is Best Comedy Special. Now, I'm going to be honest, there weren't too many comedy specials that were released this year. Because of COVID, there just weren't that many live events filmed. Uh, so literally everything that's listed here are the only comedy specials that I liked this year. So just being completely honest. Uh, so Brian Regan on the rocks, he is kind of like dad humor, but very uh, goofy expressions. And I've always been a fan of Brian Regan. He's sort of like Jim Carrey in that way. Uh, very entertaining. Uh, Jimmy Carr, his dark material. He is a Brit, British guy, very similar to Ricky Gervais, I would say, where he sort of pushes the edge of what is socially acceptable. And especially nowadays with uh, cancel culture, it's almost like he's begging people to cancel him. And it's kind of refreshing in that way. Uh, Michael Che, Shame the Devil. Uh, I wish he was as funny on SNL as he is in this special. I'm not really a huge fan of uh, SNL anymore, but Michael Che is particularly funny in the special. And then my last honorable mention is Tig Notaro's Drawn, which I had to include even though it wasn't my favorite material of hers. It's a very unique uh, thing that she did where the whole thing is animated and each one of her bits has a different style of animation. So it's kind of an intriguing uh, experiment in what a stand-up special can be. So I put it on the honorable mentions. All right, my runner-up for best uh, comedy special is one that I'm kind of dreading to admit that I even watched or liked, but I'm just going to be completely honest. It is Louis C.K.'s latest special, Sorry. So recently, for his last two specials, because Louis C.K. has officially been canceled because of his terrible um, behavior in real life, 
um, he can only release his specials on his own website. So you have to go to his website in order to see his specials. Uh, however, if you're going to separate the art from the artist, which it's completely understandable if you are unable to do that. Uh, but uh, he still has it. In terms of pure technical comedy writing skill, he is one of the most brilliant uh, comedians uh, alive today. Um, so while I felt kind of icky watching some of these things, and I can't help but laugh sometimes at his uh, material, he has very poignant insights into how the world works, um, and he pushes boundaries, and now that his life is kind of cancelled, it almost feels like he has nothing to lose anymore, so he can talk about whatever he wants. Um, so yeah, kind of a uh, weird, touchy um, special to honor in this way, but I have to give him credit for his sheer technical comedy writing skills. But my favorite comedy special of the year is Bo Burnham's Inside. So it might be a little bit of misleading to call it just a comedy special, when really Bo Burnham's Inside is sort of like this multimedia um, artistic experiment in a way. Pretty much Bo Burnham much like all of us, was stuck inside and he wasn't able to record comedy shows with live uh, crowds or anything like that. So in lieu of that, he created all of these amazing comedy segments and comedy bits and music numbers. And pretty much uh, throughout this special, it starts off like just trying to stave off boredom. But as it goes on, it really goes deep into some of those um, hard feelings that we had to deal with of social isolation and things like that. Um, it's a very poignant uh, special that dives deep into a lot of the feelings we felt during the pandemic. So this is one that is going to last for a very long time. This is like a watershed moment in comedy specials. So uh, Bo Burnham's Inside definitely by far, uh, far and ahead of all the other specials is the winner this year. All right, my next category is worst movie of the year. I don't want to trash movies too often on this channel uh, because what's the point? People work hard on movies and, you know, to trash a movie is to trash someone's life work. But whatever, let's just trash them anyway because sometimes it's fun. Uh, so one of the most misguided movies of the year was Sia's Music. So even though I like the individual music numbers in it, uh, the movie is about an autistic girl that uh, basically envisions music videos in her head uh, that are abstract representations of what she experiences. Uh, so the music videos, once they cut to those, the movie's fine, but when they cut to the real world portions of the film where Maddie Ziegler is um, basically doing an impression of Simple Jack from Tropic Thunder, it is beyond cringeworthy and uh, you just have to shake your head and wonder what were they thinking. Um, so yeah, music, maybe they were trying to go for like a Forrest Gump type story, but they went too far, I would say. Uh, next up is the terrible horror sequel, The Forever Purge. It's the worst of the Purge movies, which is saying a lot. Uh, next up is Locked Down, which was a movie from Doug Lyman, who is typically a pretty reliable director. He's made some of my favorite movies. But this one was one of the first star-studded attempts at uh, making a movie during the pandemic, and it did not work out. It was very boring, and uh, yeah, it was just not a great movie. And then finally, one of my biggest disappointments of the year. I hate to put this on the list, especially because it seems like there are some people that are digging this movie, but I really did not like The Matrix Resurrections. I thought it actively ruined the previous Matrix trilogy. I'm a huge Matrix fan, so I was looking forward to this movie, but I just thought, just let the story of Neo and Trinity die, and they brought it back for weak reasons, in my opinion, so that one was disappointing, and the action wasn't even good, which is why you go to the Matrix movies in the first place. Uh, so what's my runner-up for worst movie? It is Halloween Kills. This is probably a low point for the Halloween franchise, which is saying a lot. Uh, it's completely and utterly pointless. It's the middle of a Halloween trilogy, so you know no one's going to die in this movie of importance. None of the kills are particularly fun to watch. It defies logic at every turn, um, and you have some really half-baked political allegories as well. So um, not only is it not fun, 
but it's trying to have some sort of a serious message when, at the end of the day, Halloween Kills is this goofy film. Um, so, yeah, I would much rather watch some of the quote-unquote bad Halloween movies, like Halloween Resurrection, than watch this movie again. So, that's my opinion on it. As a huge horror fan, I was supremely disappointed in this movie. But, one movie that offended my sensibilities even more for worst movie of the year, it is Tom and Jerry, two of the most beloved cartoon characters ever made, uh, star in this new film. And if you have children, do not take them to see this movie. Let it sink down to the very, very bottoms of the Walmart discount bins on DVD, never to be watched again. Just stay away. All right, so enough with that crap. Let's move on to the next category, which is the Rotten My Ass Award. This, These are all movies that have a technically rotten tomato meter score on the review aggregate site Rotten Tomatoes, but they're movies that I loved. And so don't listen to the tomato meter, these movies that have that green splat on the website. These are movies that I would recommend you check out, even if the critics did not appreciate them as much. So first up is the true crime series, Crime Scene, The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel. This show, I was riveted by this show. Um, I was so involved in the mystery of solving what was going on. There was security camera footage that captured some really, really creepy stuff, and the way they solve the mystery behind a girl's disappearance is so interesting. It was binge-worthy. I watched it all in one go. I don't know why people didn't like it. Next up is Adam McKay's political satire, Don't Look Up. This one I can understand why people didn't like, but I really enjoyed it. It was sort of like a Doctor Strange love for the modern day. Uh, so I really like that. Leonardo DiCaprio delivers a fantastic performance in it as well. Uh, next up is Venom, Let There Be Carnage, uh, the second movie in the Venom series. And I loved this movie. Um, I don't know what it is about this character, but I really like his bromance with this alien symbiote character. And it's sort of like an odd couple story set in the Marvel Universe, so I really appreciated it, even though the critics, not so much. All right, and lastly is Mortal Kombat, which is one of the rare video game movies that works. Uh, the action is great, the special effects are amazing, uh, it has a decent enough story to string things along, and yeah, I think it's the best Mortal Kombat movie to date. I would rank this among some of the top video game movies. Not that that's necessarily a high bar to set, but I had a good time with Mortal Kombat. All right, so my runner-up for Rotten My Ass is Wolf. It is, again, about this group of youths who feel like they are animals, and they're in this mental institution, this correctional facility, to try to make them normal again. And you can read all kinds of different uh, things into... Uh, this sort of like gay conversion therapy or things like that. Um, it's this fascinating uh, film that you can uh, apply all kinds of different analogies to. Um, and it has a fantastic central performance from George McKay as this boy who thinks he's a wolf. And it's almost like he has these like very, very strong urges to be a wolf. And you see the, uh, his, the tendons in his neck stretch as he tries to stop himself, but he can't help but howl at the moon. It is like this really riveting, interesting, different science fiction uh, drama film that uh, I guess the critics didn't like. But I thought it was a really intriguing film. So don't let the critic score uh, dissuade you from seeing this movie. I thought it was great. All right, but the number one movie that I thought the critics didn't understand but I loved was Malcolm and Marie. As you've already seen me, uh, I gave Zendaya and John David Washington honorable mentions in my acting categories. And I think this is a powerhouse movie for these two young actors. Um... I think one of the main criticisms of this movie is the fact that it's a white male directing a film about two black uh, people, and it's sort of about the black experience. And to that I say, Zendaya herself is a producer on this movie, and I don't think they would have agreed to the film if they didn't agree to um, the content in it. So, I don't know, that seems like a very weak argument to me. I don't know why people are heaping so much uh, problems on this film. I thought it was two of the best performances of the year. It felt like a play. It was such a strong, interesting, uh, great relationship, uh, or the destruction of a relationship on film, and I... I loved it, so I don't know. It's splitting audiences. I'd say make up your own mind. 
All right, and the final category is best retro discovery. All right, so I'm gonna try to go quick with this uh, because my phone is running out of space and I capture this, believe it or not, on my phone. So these are all movies that I watched for the first time that had to have come out at least 20 or more years ago. All right, so first up is Mikey and Nikki. It's sort of a buddy crime film with two like low lives trying to find their way through life. Sort of like an old school version of the Safdie Brothers' Good Time. Loved it. Elaine May, great director. Uh, second, it's sort of like a Twilight Zone type movie from 1960s. Hands on a Hard Body is a documentary about a contest held in Texas each year where people have to put their hand on a truck and the last person to uh, take their hand off of it wins that truck. It's surprisingly moving, surprisingly poignant portrait of American life. You start to get invested in this contest. It's great. Uh, and then also a Charlie Chaplin movie that I had yet to see until this year was The Circus. It has amazing uh, stunts involving animals. Charlie Chaplin, always delightful. So I would also recommend that one. And my runner up for best retro discovery is Class of 1984. This is a movie where uh, it's sort of the opposite of all those inspirational teacher movies like Stand and Deliver and Dead Poets Society. It's about uh, basically when the kids, you cannot reach them. What happens when the kids are pure evil and the teachers have to deal with terrible uh, kids. As a teacher myself, I got some joy out of the cynical nature of this film. And probably one of the standout scenes is Roddy McDowell where he just can't take it anymore and he takes a gun and that's the only time the kids are quiet and listen to him is when he does that. Probably happy-go-lucky teachers who don't like to look at cynical things won't like this movie, but as someone who gets joy out of those sorts of uh, things, I would recommend Class of 1984. And my final superlative, my favorite retro discovery this year was in fact China Syndrome. This is a nuclear disaster movie from the 1970s, probably the peak of the disaster film, and Jack Lemmon stars as this very conflicted worker at a nuclear power plant where basically the inspections of the plant were not up to snuff and they almost had a nuclear meltdown. And there's this news crew uh, who kind of discover that this potential uh, disaster almost happened and it's this very intense um, film about uncovering the truth. And especially nowadays when we live in a very conspiratorial world where no one believes the government or the CDC or anything like that, I thought it was a especially poignant film. All right, so those are all of my superlatives this year. It was uh, quite the journey and I hope you enjoyed it. And be on the lookout for my top 10 official movies of 2021 coming very soon. So if you agree or disagree with any of my takes, definitely let me know in the comments. And until next time, I'll see you later.